All right. Thanks to everyone for coming today. Once again, conditions are such that we are forced to hold our annual research symposium online for a second year. Uh, sorry about that, but I'm glad that all of you have joined us today. Um, before we begin, uh, I think we'd like to note that while we are meeting today, there is an active conflict underway where innocent lives are being lost in Israel and Palestine. Many of us and many of you have relatives and families impacted by this conflict. The staff of the archive hopes that the violence will soon cease and we wish peace for both Palestinians and Israelis. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Stephen Aaron and I'm the director of the Fortune Up Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. I'm grateful to all of you for zooming in from other parts of the country and the world after a long year of Zoom-based events. This is the archive's fourth research symposium. Our fellowship program is still very young, but I hope that you will agree after seeing the results of today's symposium that it aims to make a significant contribution to international scholarship about and based upon video testimonies of Holocaust survivors. We established the Fortune Off Archives Fellowship Program with the launch of the Hartman Fellowship in 2018, uh, where it was conceived as a, a fitting way to honor one of the archive's founders, its faculty advisor for decades, Professor Jeffrey Hartman, who passed away on March 14, 2016. An eminent professor of comparative literature at Yale, Jeffrey's vision and leadership helped build the Fortune Off Archive into the institution that it is today. Our fellowship program has grown to include other fellowships, all named for the four founders of the archive, Dory Lau, Jeffrey Hartman, Laurel Vlock, and Willie Rosenberg. Four recurring fellowships with different areas of focus for four individuals with whom we would not be here today. Beyond our founders, there are many other individuals and organizations to whom I would like to offer a few words of thanks. This fellowship program would not be possible without the support of our faculty advisor, Timothy Snyder, Professor Doug Rogers, who's head of your Russian, East European and Eurasian studies at Yale, and Jenny Shamazna at the Macmillan Center, which is the official institutional home of all of our fellows at Yale. The archive is grateful for all of your assistance recruiting and shepherding our international fellows through the process of becoming part of the Yale community. I would also like to thank our partners at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute, in particular, Eva Kovac, for providing the framework funding and international support for our joint fellows in Vienna. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Fortunoff, Blaustein, Cole, Hornos, Libby, and Ross families, and dozens of other donors, large and small, that help make the archive possible. The primary goal of the fellowship program is to encourage scholarship in the collection and to unlock testimonies and make them more accessible in as intellectually as well as um, accessible to users. By, by charging our fellows with the task of producing an annotated critical edition of a single testimony from the collection. I'd like to invite our Hartman fellow, Gil Rubin, to tell us more about the critical edition series as well, as, well as introduce our speakers today. Gil. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so I'm just gonna think just for a few minutes, um, I'm going to introduce our critical editions series um, that was launched um, earlier this year um, in February. And I'm actually going to share my screen now um, and tell you a little bit about what it is. Um, so um, every year um, our postdoctoral fellows are visiting scholars um, and various other people associated with the, um, with the archive uh, produce a critical edition. Um, and uh, what the critical, critical edition is, and does everybody see the page currently or? Yeah, okay. What a critical edition is, is basically um, every visiting scholar selects one testimony from our collection. Um, and then they produce um, two things. From it. They produce an introduction, which is a text that is designed for the public, for students, for other researchers, that places that testimony in its historical context and situates it within the contemporary historical scholarship and literature that is relevant for it. Um, so we, we could have um, about, right now we have eight different um, testimonies here, um, eight different critical editions. Um, and the second thing um, that it does is it actually, um, the, the, the researcher and scholar, the look at the, the view um, the testimony and they pre present um, and they produce an annotated um, transcript. That is, once you view the transcript online, I'm going to show it in a second, you can actually see um, explanations of various words, places, and so forth that help you kind of understand that testimony um, and situate it in its time and place. So I'm going to look now at just one testimony um, at one of our critical editions and kind of guide you through it. 
Um, so this is this was produced by Sarah Garibova, who was um, one of the um, Hartman Fellows here. Um, and what you can see here through this online viewer is that we have an online um, display of um, her introduction to the testimony that presents kind of the, the general historical background, but also situates it with the relevant literature. Um, you can click on the various footnotes um, here and get um, kind of either more information or other sources that are relevant. Um, and this is how it's kind of viewed online from the landing page to viewing um, each and every testimony. Um, and then um, if, you, if you want, you can actually hear there, hear songs from the testimony. Um, so they will um, open up and you can actually listen to um, this. In this case, the edition she worked on um, includes a song that was later reproduced um, also um, in our Songs from the Testimonies project. Um, and additionally, beyond this, you can actually go online and view the testimony that is opened, uh, open to everyone to view. Uh, I'll just open it here um, and view it together with um, an annotated Война. transcript. So I'll just show how it works. Um, so you can see over here, once there's a word um, that requires any type of explanation, um, so you can see here, um, you know, Dr. Garibova's um, explanation on this specific word, on this specific concept, on this specific idea that is presented um, in the annotated transcript. Um, so the idea here is actually to take our testimonies that are often um, accessible um, either in a specific language to a group of researchers or people who speak the language and bring them to researchers um, who might not work on this specific subset of testimonies and languages, bring them to students and bring them to the public. Um, and so far within the critical edition series, um, we have eight different um, critical editions and we hope to add more throughout the year. And actually three of the talks um, that we are going to hear um, today are, um, are actually going to turn into critical editions. And I think the speakers um, will present um, more about that. Um, I, will I will add now to the chat um, a link to our critical edition series. And um, I'm happy to answer any, uh, happy to answer any more questions about this. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of present here both so we can kind of celebrate and announce the publication of the series, which um, you know, was um, the result of a lot of effort of work um, by our scholars um, and, and other people at the archive um, and also kind of give context into some of the talks that we'll hear today and see actually how these critical editions are created and the type of questions um, and issues that the scholars are grappling with as they produce it. Um, so I'm going to um, put it in the chat um, in a minute. Uh, but before we do that, um, I'm just going to present our first speaker for today. Um, so basically how it's going to work, we have two sessions. Um, so um, Chad Gibbs and Julie Dawson are going to present first um, and then we'll have a Q&A session and then we will um, hear presentations from Wendy Lauer and Jonathan Petropoulos. Um, and I'll just start with a short intro, um, a short biography of Chad, um, and uh, then I'll, I'll give him the floor and let him speak. Uh, Chad Gibbs is a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the inaugural Dory Laub Fellow at the Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. Um, and we wanna congratulate him that in the fall of 2021, he will take up the position of Assistant Professor of Jewish Studies and Director of the Zucker Goldberg Center for Holocaust Studies at the College of Charleston. Um, and he works on resistance at Treblinka um, and his work on the topic um, was supported by fellowships from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the USC Shoah Foundation and the Georgia Mossad Program in History. Um, and today he's going to present about his work about resistance um, in Treblinka and I'll just, um, give you the floor and let you present. All right, thank you for that in introduction. Are you seeing my screen okay? All right. On the occasion of Samuel Willenberg's passing in 2016, media outlets around the world mourned him as the last Treblinka death camp survivor. Many outlets ran stories and obituaries prominently featuring that word last. Two days later though, the Times of Israel corrected itself by running another story entitled Quote, there are still Tremelika survivors among us. Uh, one tells his tale, unquote. Having seen earlier reports, the daughter of Leon Ritz reached out to the press to tell of her father's experiences. Ritz still lives in Sweden, where he uh, settled not long after World War II. Uh, he's well known there, but his story hadn't come to the attention of press outside of Sweden. Um, after the Times and other outlets wrote about Ritz, though, a new framing of survival at Treblinka began to take hold. Um, the Times subsequently relabeled Willenberg the final survivor of the August 1943 Treblinka prisoners' revolt with italic emphasis. Um, Leon Ritz, as he explained to Amanda Borschel-Don of the Times, 
escaped Treblinka before the now famous August 2nd, 1943 revolt. Ritz also survived several other camps. Um, these facts led Borshal Don questioning, uh, left her questioning how we should uh, label his experiences. She wondered whether um, it was factually correct to call Ritz a Treblinka survivor because he was also imprisoned at Majdanek, Buchenwald, and Bergen-Belsen. Borshal Don took her question to Yad Vashem's Echud Emir, who assured her that there is, quote, no binding definition of how a Holocaust survivor is labeled. A person who is in several camps can be considered a survivor from each camp in which they were a prisoner, unquote. The passing of Samuel Gillenberg and the late recognition of Leon Ritz opened new conversations in the media. Noting as they did the different kinds of survival stories told by Willenberg and Ritz, media outlets began to qualify different versions of survival at Treblinka. Willenberg became the last Treblinka revolt survivor, while Ritz holds center stage as the last living survivor and uh, a pre-revolt escapee. Amir's explanation highlights the fact that there's no commonly understood way to label Holocaust survivor experiences. And in addition to this, at present, there's no historiography of the term survivor as it relates to a specific place like a camp, ghetto, or shooting site. Many historians and organizations offer capacious and respectful definitions of the wider term Holocaust survivor, but I don't think we have looked at how the term survivor can be employed locally and what that might do for research. Uh, I think that lack of place specific understandings of survival is particularly noteworthy um, with the vibrant expansion of spatial Holocaust research. But as they reacted to the passing of Willenberg and the late emergence of Ritz, reporters began an exploration of these questions and what their answers might mean for understandings of the Holocaust. A revisitation of survival at Treblinka offers opportunities to analyze what it means to be a survivor of a certain place during the Holocaust, as well as a chance to assess how many Jews made it out of this extermination camp and how they did so. Defining survivorship for individual Holocaust locations like the thousands of camps and ghettos of the Nazi system is an essential step for historians seeking to clarify the roles, uses, and evolutions of those sites. At Treblinka, the varied means of survival represented by people like Willenberg and Ritz also point to a need for like some basic categories of survivor experience. Research that defines survival of certain places can, for instance, help scholars understand the reach and influence of a site beyond its seemingly discrete fences, walls, or uh, borders like that. My own interest in survival at Treblinka and finding out how many people survive this place comes from uh, my works need to deal with a, a well-accepted number of survivors at Treblinka. Um, many in this audience and other panelists here might, might know the number 68 that might jump out at them as the, uh, the accepted number of survivors at Treblinka. And that number comes from the 1979 book, The Death Camp Treblinka, um, an edited volume by a man named Alexander Donat, who was himself a, a Holocaust survivor and had been in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, he listed 68 people that he was able to find in the process of his research in the mid 70s. And though he said at the time that that list was anything but, uh, I think his exact words were, are, um, anything but exhaustive, uh, it's pretty much gained a canonical acceptance. Um, when I begin talking about my work at a conference or something like that, I usually get the question, how do you do work on Treblinka? There were only 68 survivors. It happens quite a bit. It's a very well accepted number. Um, but I have looked at this matter of how many people survived Treblinka and come now to, after a lot of archival work throughout my dissertation research, come to uh, 251 named or identified survivors of the camp and come up with three main ways in which they survived Treblinka. So of those 251 people, 71 are revolt survivors like Isidore H from the Fortunov archive. And that category kind of, it seems to jump out as the most easy to explain category of survival experience at Treblinka, but it gets, it gets somewhat murky um, and it is instructive for finding the boundaries of the camp. 
Um, so Isidore H. escaped Treblinka on um, August 2nd, 1943, during that, that prisoner revolt. Uh, he took part in the revolt, but if I'm looking at whether or not to put a person in that category, I don't require that they took part or even knew that resistance was going to take place that day. For me, it's enough that uh, they saw the revolt taking place and wisely made for the fences as everyone else did. Um, where the category gets instructive about the limits of Treblinka local power is in looking at the, so about 300 people made it out during the revolt, but we've only identified 71 of those individuals. Many lost their lives in, in the chase away from Treblinka or um, were perhaps some were caught by locals um, and brought back to the camp in, in search of, in hope of a reward, um, so on and so forth. So in looking at how far they got away from the camp, um, after how much time they were brought back, I, I believe that in that we can kind of see the local power of Treblinka and its, and its perpetrators. The uh, second group of individuals that I look at, a uh, larger group that is, that I look at is escapees. Um, and to disambiguate that term, I mean anyone who escaped Treblinka on a day other than August 2nd, 1943. It's uh, to my knowledge, it is only um, these 74 people are only individuals who escaped before the revolt. So sometimes they escaped in um, random acts, uh, unplanned acts, I should say. Uh, and sometimes they escaped in kind of smaller scale, uh, networked, um, pre-planned events where they and uh, I think the largest I've seen is about nine others got out at the same time by coming up with and planning a means to escape the camp. Um, and what they do and what looking at this category and its, uh, and its timeline, especially because there's a certain date at which about January of 1943, um, at which escape from Treblinka really comes to an end. This uh, option of resistance, this option of trying to survive the camp kind of stops being viable. Um, and that is because there had been so many escapes. You'll notice that number is just, it's pretty large, I believe, for a camp that only operated for 11 months and um, larger than our previous knowledge of how many people who survived at all. And in that, I've, it instructs as to how big of a problem escape was for the Nazi guards who ran Treblinka. So much so that in January of 43, they opened a new barracks building that basically cut off this version of, this, of survival. But at the same time, um, that was something of a putting out a bonfire by starting a forest fire, because once they moved all Treblinka prisoners to that new barracks, prisoner uh, testimonies then start to say, well, now we could plan a revolt because we could all talk to each other in the barracks at night. So that was a pivotal turning point in Treblinka history brought about by this form of resistance by escapes prior to the revolt. And finally, there's one last major um, category that I wanna cover. Um, perhaps I'll have to leave some of it for Q and A if we wanna get there, um, but I call this last group through transport survivors. And this sort of changes our understanding of how the Nazis used Treblinka as a part of the wider Holocaust because the certain timing of people who were brought to Treblinka stepped off the train um, and were then put back on a train to somewhere else tells us about the camp's role in wider perpetration. So Ben L here, um, who was incredibly um, shocking for me to find because it turned out that Ben L, uh, his, his family is actually uh, third generation Wisconsin Badgers. So I ended up finding out that uh, a current undergrad at my own university is a descendant of, uh, of this man. Um, and these people came in about two different ways. They came as the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was taking place. And they also came as a uh, resistance was going on in the Bialystok Ghetto. And in a longer explanation, I could get into how that really informs us about Treblinka's, how Treblinka fit into these other events and how those other events changed what went on at Treblinka. Um, that being my last major case, if you've been following along quickly with your calculator or something, you'll notice that the numbers don't entirely add up. And that's because there are some 
individuals, their 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 story doesn't exactly give us enough information to uh, to say for certain how they survived. And um, there are a few very unique cases, um, but I couldn't get into those in the amount of time here. So, um, just to to wrap up, uh, Leon Ritz, the media's quote last survivor of Treblinka, may well be the last living voice of survivor at survival at this extermination camp. Though it's impossible to know for certain, I think that's the most important thing to point out about any making of a list. The fact that a Treblinka survivor would now be nearing 100 years old makes it likely that Mr. Ritz is alone in his experiences. Similarly, the increasing age of all but the youngest child survivors of the Holocaust means that these last experience and last voice news stories, I think will sadly only increase in the coming years. As they do, journalists like the Times Borschel Don will struggle to find prudent and respectful ways to describe the lives and paths of the people they cover. Historians, I think, would, be, would do well to get ahead of this coming wave of media definitions by providing their own. This, however, is not the only reason that scholars should address the definition of survivorship at the places they study. Research on Treblinka demonstrates that we should be prepared to find another kind of last survivor of the camp. Many individuals uh, now passed away remain unacknowledged survivors of this place. The permanently incomplete nature of any survivor list means that even after Mr. Ritz leaves us, Others who survived will still await recognition. Defining place-specific survival can advance our understandings of localized perpetration, the actions of victims in context, and the spatial reach of individual sites of Holocaust criminality. Revolt survivors compel us to consider where the bounds of this camp stopped, complicating any simplistic view of the fences as its bounds of perpetrator power. Escape survivors, meanwhile, provide an important understanding of how Jewish resistance changed the very face of Treblinka and helped create the conditions needed for revolt planning. Through transport, survivors take, us, uh, take our knowledge of resistance other than revolt still further, um, while also allowing us to see how Treblinka fit into the wider Holocaust, as well as how camp routines changed over time. I don't propose a single definition of place-based survivorship. I think that many of the over 44,000 camps and ghettos of the Third Reich will require unique understandings. The thousands of mass shooting sites may demand still more reckonings with the idea of survivorship. Localized definitions, though, will help scholars seeking to understand the experiences, choices, and paths of the individuals they study who were forced to confront Nazi genocide. Spatial studies of the Holocaust will benefit still further from this means of determining the boundaries of their studies and how they fit into overall trends. Finally, the, uh, the act of, of defining survival in a capacious and respectful manner makes it possible to honor the stories of the people that we study. Increasing the number of survivors of a place like Treblinka that killed as many as 925,000 people from 68 to 251 in no way alters its overwhelming lethality. The importance of my work for the history of Treblinka is instead the creation of an update to Denot's list that's more capable of foregrounding uh, the differences in individual paths to survival and demonstrating to interested researchers that additional testimonial evidence awaits their use. Um, the stories of those left off Donat's list deserve recognition and inclusion by future scholars, even while we continue to acknowledge that no list will ever be complete. And thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Chad. Um, thank you so much um, for your talk. Um, I'll just um, remind everyone that you can uh, leave questions in the Q&A and that we'll take them after Chad's talk. Uh, it was a wonderful talk and super um, super interesting, and I think it's going to tie to some of the other things we're going to hear today. Um, did somebody raise his hand? Um, Jonathan? I, I did raise my hand, at least virtually. Um, thank you, Chad, for an excellent talk. Very interesting. I wanted to ask you about the uh, through transport survivors. Um, mm -hmm. I confess I had not heard about people arriving at Treblinka and then diverted and sent elsewhere. Could, could you elaborate and tell us a bit more about what the purpose 
purpose was and what the experience was like for those through transport survivors? Thanks. Sure, thank you. Um, I think, so there's two, two more prevalent experiences among that group. Uh, number one is that individuals would arrive at Treblinka sometimes and the train would stop at Treblinka to the extermination camp. And then at times, the labor needs of Treblinka 1, the nearby uh, labor and penal camp, which um, is often said to have been for Polish prisoners, but it had a large Jewish population as well. Sometimes that camp's needs, if we want to put it that way, would be um, met by taking people off of a train at Treblinka 2 and putting them back on, um, sorting them if you want, and putting them back on a train to Treblinka 1. And we learn about resistance in this moment, even if it's a very short period of time, because a lot of stories are told about how, how people tried to look ready for work, how they tried to jump into a line if they saw that, you know, this was the right line to be in. So there's a lot of very quick thinking resistance that's like short episodes, but very important and saves many lives. Um, that other group is usually sent on to Maidanic. So at the time of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, particularly, I'll just um, simplify things by staying on that one topic with this answer. Um, at the time of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, it seems that um, the Nazis tried to push the population of the Warsaw Ghetto out on trains as fast as they possibly could. And that meant that they didn't sort probably in the way that they normally did. And people were instead sorted at Treblinka and then those thought fit for labor will, were placed back on the train and sent to Lublin Majdanek. Um, so that, that experience happens at basically two different times. It's kind of the same episode, the same um, reasoning going on, but it occurs at the time of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and at the time of resistance in the Bialystok Ghetto as that is being uh, closed. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you, very, very helpful. Um, out of curiosity, what was the survival rate at Majdanek for the people who were sent on there? Um, probably very, very low as well, I, I would presume, right? It's, it's, yeah, so it's, it's very, it's low, it's not good. However, it's, um, it's way better. It, it, you know, it's way better than if they had stayed at Treblinka, where there's basically, other than the revolt, um, once you're in the camp, if you can't get out in the revolt or you can't escape on your own, it's almost certain death. Um, being sent on to Majdanek after you've already been chosen, quote unquote, fit for work, um, the, the chances of survival are much, much better than had you not stayed or than had you stayed at Treblinka. So it's um, a lot of those people do lose their lives later, um, either through being worked um, worked far too hard at wherever they were sent next. Um, but I, you know, I didn't actually say in the talk that I, I count someone as a Treblinka survivor, even if they die later in the Holocaust. And I know of many individuals who fit um, that explanation. Hmm. Um, but I think that we need to keep them there because they, you know, that doesn't change the, the one event in their life to have, to have uh, perished in another incident. Um, but yeah, it, it's still bad, uh, just to sum up, but um, so much better than, than staying at Treblinka. Thank you, excellent. Thank you, um, thank you both. I think we're gonna take the rest of the questions that seem there's another uh, question from uh, Professor Minon Pod, um, but we'll take them, I think, after Julie's um, presentation, just so we um, kind of take the questions together. That's fine, I mean, I, I, I could have did that again, but. Um, so I'll just um, present um, Julie briefly, and then um, after um, Julie's presentation, um, we're going to have a Q&A session um, with uh, both Julie and Chad. Um, Julie Dawson is the um, Fortuna Fellow at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute um, and a doctoral candidate at the University of Vienna's Institute for Contemporary History. Her dissertation examines post-war Jewish life in Romania through the lens of recently found diaries of, trans of Transnistrian survivors. Um, she worked for the Leo Beck Institute from 2010 to 2019 and directed their archival survey of Transylvania and Bukovina from 2012 to 2019. Um, and she was a researcher um, in Medias and Romania for the EU Horizon, EU Horizon 2020 project called Traces, Transmitting Contentious Cultural Heritage with the Arts. 
Um, and she's published several articles, um, which you can see um, on our um, website, on her, on her bio and our website. And her research more generally includes um, Jewish Bukovina, Communist Romania, Women's History, Trauma, and Memory Studies. Um, and I'll let you start uh, presenting Julie. Um, and please write any other questions you have for either Julie and Chad in the Q&A session, and we will discuss them uh, briefly. All right, thank you very much, Gil and Stephen and the Fortunoff Archive for the invitation and support. Um, my project is uh, somewhat different from the other presentations as my focus is not on oral histories per se, but rather on this newly discovered written testimony that Gil mentioned, a set of diaries written in the immediate post-war period in Romania. Uh, due to the nature of the diaries, however, consulting oral histories is crucial for contextualizing my subject's Holocaust experience and that I use oral histories to complement and expand my subject's writings. I'm also only a little halfway through my fellowship. I took maternity leave partway through, so my research is still ongoing. Um, I view new material every week, every day, and gain new insights all the time. In the short talk, I'm going to introduce my overall project with the diaries as the core analytic lens. I'll give some biographical background on the author. I'll dip just a tiny bit into trauma theory and discuss my continuing examination of the associated oral histories. So, the diary. One spring day in 2009, a peach colored notebook was discovered by volunteers cleaning up a document littered woman's balcony of a shuttered synagogue in a small Transylvanian town. The notebook, it quickly became clear, was a diary filled from cover to cover with carefully penciled German, the words very clear to read and often distressed. Eventually, four notebooks and several related papers were found. Containing over 800 entries, the diary stretched from 1948 to 1961 and record the post-war life of brief and limited triumph of a young survivor of the Transnistrian Holocaust, Blanca Leibzelte. These diaries are a tremendous tool for researchers. They provide multifaceted entry points for examining daily life of Jewish survivors in the initial decades after the war, as well as for analyzing the repercussions of violent trauma to everyday life. They indicate spaces in which individuals were able to perform acts of agency despite totalitarian strictures and also those places where the cold machinations of the totalitarian state devastated individual lives. They moreover shed light on cultural and social practices in Jewish life at the time with especially fascinating insights into the operations of Romanian Zionist youth organizations in the late 1940s about which little to nothing has been written to date. Furthermore, as an inherently gendered source, the writings testify to the life of a young single woman raised at the interface of tradition and modernity, struggling for a voice in a profoundly patriarchal nation. Finally, the author's narration of global events from the founding of the State of Israel to the 1956 Hungarian uprising, as well as of political and cultural responses to the Holocaust, such as the establishment of German reparations and the publication of Anna Frank's diaries, indicate an interconnectedness to the world that belies an assumed impermeability, the Iron Curtain. So who was Blanca Leibzeltin? Blanca Leibzeltin was born near or in Chernovitz in the early, mid, early to mid 1920s. Her father, Josef Leibzeltin, was a civil servant during the Austro-Hungarian period, fill, filling official cl clerical duties in several Bukovinian villages and towns. Her mother, Anna, grew up in Chernovitz, and her family overlapped with the social circles of Paul Anschel, later the poet Chalan. Leitzelter's first cousin, Gustav, was Gustav Homed, was close boyhood friends with Anschel, and in post-war correspondence, the two wrote nostalgically of Gustav's home in the Topfergasse, this being also the home of Leitzelter's grandparents and aunt and uncle. The late Selter family were entrenched German-speaking Central European Jews. Her older brother had recently graduated from the University of Prague in architecture. Her fiancé had studied medicine there. Her father, most recently secretary of the Vashkauts Town Hall, was in his 60s at the start of the war, living in quiet retirement in a home with a garden full of fruit trees and a small riverside town, a short train ride from Chernovitz. The Leibzelters were generally assimilated and marginally religious, probably in the inferred manner explained in one testimony from Perl Taub of Chernovitz, 
who when asked about her family's religious observance and education, the mirrors, but when asked specifically whether her mother lit candles on Friday evenings, answers, oh, definitely, yes, yes. When the war broke out, Leib Selter was probably 19 or 20. She was well-educated, speaking besides her German mother tongue, Romanian, Russian, and English. Most likely she understood Yiddish and Ukrainian. <clears throat> she had a deep appreciation for theater, literature, and the arts, a distinct distaste for manual labor, and was deeply ashamed of depending on charity. In the summer of 1941, after the Barbarossa operation began, the Romanian army invaded northern Bukovina, which had been occupied by the Soviet Union the previous year. During the first few weeks of July 1941, pogroms were carried out in countless villages in this region. Perpetrators included Romanian soldiers, Ukrainian or Romanian peasants, as well as a German Einsatztruppe. In Leibselter's home of Boschkauts, the Jews were pulled from their houses and gathered at the Gendarmerie. <clears throat> A group of prominent men were selected for execution, marched to a low hillside outside the town and shot. Among these were Leib Selter's father and brother, Yosef and Bruno. Her fiance, she learns, was similarly murdered in a different location. Leib Selter and her mother, Anna, <clears throat> were later deported to Transnistria, where they spent three years in the Mogilev ghetto. Upon their release in 1945, the women returned initially to Chernovitz. Regarding this homecoming, Leib Selter writes, quote, the hour arrived where we saw appear in the distance the towers of the Chernovitz Archbishop's residence. I gazed spellbound upon these towers and listened inside for an echo of joy, but there was nothing of the kind. I sensed only my raw sore heart and worries about the future, end quote. She goes on to explain the motives for their subsequent departure. Quote, we felt poorly in the old home upon the ruins of our lives, plagued day and night, by the most horrid memories and among those who are not innocent in our tragedy, end quote. The two women left, making their way eventually to the black seaport town of Constanza. Here the diaries begin in January of 1948 and until 1961, when she finally received her long for exit visa, Leib Selta kept record of her daily life and struggle with loneliness, her mother's eventual death from tuberculosis in 1952, and always a penetrating grief. When she left in 1961, she passed the diaries to her cousin, Babette Homed, Gustav's sister, who had settled after the war in Mediash, town in Transylvania. Her last recorded words are, quote, I am very exhausted. The moment approaches to leave the old home and seek a new one. What will I find? One is not allowed to bring diaries. I cannot bring myself to destroy them. I'm entrusting them to someone for safekeeping. Will they ever find their way back to me? End quote. His diaries were found in 2009 by volunteers cleaning up the women's balcony of the synagogue in the Transylvanian town where Leib Selter's cousin had remained almost until her death in the late 1980s. My project examines these diaries from multiple perspectives as a singular testimony representing survivor narratives that have been little probed and as a source allowing unexplored insights into social and cultural history considerations of post-war Romania. My overarching research questions center around trauma, oppression, and agency. My current focus at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute and working with the Fortunoff Archive is reconstructing Leib Selter's wartime experience or context, while also deconstructing the manifestations of trauma in her post-war writings. In her seminal work on trauma and narrative, comparative literature scholar Kathy Karuf describes the double telling at the center of trauma narratives. She writes of the, quote, oscillation between a crisis of death and the correlative crisis of life, between the story of the unbearable nature of an event and the story of the unbearable nature of its survival, end quote. The diaries witness this crisis of life, but understanding Leib Selter's crisis of death is essential to presenting her story. My work with the oral histories of the Fortunoff Archive aims to fill this lacuna in Leib Selter's biography even though such a contextualization will and must be in its very nature, imperfect and incomplete. So how am I incorporating these oral histories into Leib Selter's story? Um, she herself mentions Transnistria and the diaries only a handful of times, generally when some aspect of her life recalls to her mind her experience, for example, when she and her mother are suffering from severe hunger or without heat, when her Hakshara group is thrown out of its lodgings and made to stand outside in the snowy night. 
when state bureaucracy intrudes with irrational demands. Fine details about the pogrom during which her father and brother were executed are recalled in three letters she wrote to the dead. But regarding the years in the Mogilev ghetto, she writes only a handful of nondescript sentences. Their survival, she explains, in apparent disbelief was, quote, a miracle. I cannot explain it in any other way, end quote. For my research, I'm looking at all the interviews of individuals with overlapping biographical details, especially those who spent time in Mogila. Remarkably little has been written about this site. And so I'm looking at anyone who's there or passed through. The number of individuals who actually remained in Mogilev is small. It was a transit point and many arrived only to leave within a few days. Some who escaped from camps further east made their way back to Mogilev, though generally tried to hide outside of the ghetto. The draw may have been due to the size of the town and the resulting anonymity possible. Food may have been easier to come by. Work, which resulted in food, may also have been easier to obtain. Ideally, of course, I would find an oral history from a woman of similar age and background to Leipzelter, who also spent years in the Mogilev ghetto, but thus far I've not found such an interview. The women, in fact, tend to be significantly younger than Blanca, thus they were children or adolescents during the war. These people experience, in addition to the specific acts of violence, the particular anguish of losing their innocence, learning that their parents could not protect them or their siblings. The other women tend to be older than Blanca and already with children of their own. The survival, or not, of their children generally forms the core of these women's stories. The men who were in the ghetto speak of surviving through work. It is not clear if women were able to work in the same manner as the men, and if not, then how their survival was achieved. As I mentioned, I'm only just halfway through my fellowship and I still have many interviews to listen to. Look forward to my ongoing work and especially to writing about my results. To conclude, I would like to quote scholars Mariana Hirsch and Leo Spitzer in a reflection on creating channels for silenced or neglected voices of the Transnistrian Holocaust. They remind us that quote, each individual story helps to shape a larger history by providing it with detailed depth and nuance. And in turn, each story is enhanced and given broader meaning through its contextualization within a larger historical matrix. Post generations haunted by stories that have not been worked through still find that they owe the victims this act of attentive listening, as well as this act of historical work of historical repair. End quote. And so, on that note, I want to thank the Fortunoff Archive and the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for enabling this act of attentive listening and returning a voice to a subject who is unable to publicly witness during her lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, and thank you for, the, for this wonderful talk. I think we'll open um, this up for um, some questions. Um, feel free um, to write questions um, for um, Julie and Chad now in the Q&A box and we'll read them out. I think we have a few questions uh, for Chad that people wrote um, during your presentation. Um, so I'm going to read them um, out. I'm going to just read out, start with the first two questions, although I think the second and the third one um, tie together. So I'm just going to read out the questions for Chad and, and give an opportunity to answer them. And Julie, if you have something to add to that too, please feel free uh, to jump in. Um, so um, Chad, if you want to also turn on your video and audio um, so you can um, answer that. Um, so Avinam Pat asks, what does your research suggest about knowledge of the final solution among Jews in Poland during the war? To your subjects, particularly escapees, escapees talk about encountering a refusal to believe the reports about Treblinka. Um, and Gabriel Finder asks, um, what would you consider Polish Jews who spent the war years and the Holocaust in Soviet Asia? Would you consider them also um, as survivors? Uh, if they kind of stayed within the interior of the Soviet Union. Um, and then we have another uh, question um, from Olin Steyer. Um, so you're, um, you're evolving a critical definition of survivorship. Um, your brief remarks at the end about, category, about categorizing through transport Treblinka survivors, even if they subsequently perish, were murdered in other camp as Treblinka survivors, has the potential to shake up the very notion of survival. What we do not typically classify as survivors, those, those individuals who uh, made it through one or a series of camps only to be murdered at the last one. So what will this different perspective do to understanding of survivorship related to concepts like resistance? Um, yeah, I think all, a lot of these questions um, tie together and uh, Chad, please, please, 
please feel free to answer. Yeah, um, thanks for all these questions. And um, thank Julie for her excellent talk as well. Um, I think I'll take the first part. I'm looking at the Q&A here. There, so for escapees part uh, and what they encounter about refusal to believe the reports about Treblinka, absolutely, there's there's a great deal of that in, in oral histories and other testimonies. Um, it took more than a few, the first, you know, there's a, the first wave of escapees were not believed um, or were silenced because the, the reality of what they were saying was too hard um, for people to bear. Um, but as, as time goes on, the, partly through how many people escaped the camp and how many voices there were saying what it really was, um, that information does get out and it becomes more and more accepted. And um, testimony from revolt survivors, particularly individuals who were there for more uh, a longer period in the camp, they talk about later transports from Poland, Polish Jews arriving at Treblinka, um, acting out in, in spontaneous acts of resistance as they get off the train because they know exactly what Treblinka is. Um, they, there's the people have heard about how the, the arrival area at Treblinka is painted to look like a train station. And that really, that ruse really only worked on individuals arriving from Western Europe. Um, there were Jews sent to Treblinka from 11 different nations. Um, those from Poland tended to already know what it was and there was a good deal of resistance in one form or another as they got off the train. Um, those from Western Europe or from further away tended not to know what Treblinka was and perhaps that painting of the arrival area as, um, as, a, as a train station actually worked in that way. Um, to the other two questions, I do think, um, to Dr. Fender, I do think that um, Jews who lived out the, the Holocaust years in Soviet Asia are survivors. I particular I personally like the very, very capacious uh, definition of survival that's offered by the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, that says that anyone who um, fled persecution basically from um, the, the Nazi rise to power in 1933, however they get out, wherever they go, is a Holocaust survivor. And then to Dr. Steyer's question that's sort of connected to that, um, I would say that I, I see where you're asking that. And I think in the longer piece, I talk about how that, that individual is still not a survivor of the Holocaust, that person who dies after getting out of Treblinka, but they have survival experiences in their past. Um, uh, all of these people are victims of the Holocaust, to be sure. So that, that terminology doesn't really help us either. But to say that someone who perishes at their last camp, I would still say they're not a Holocaust survivor because they perished. Um, but they can be, they can have a past that is as a survival uh, survivor of Treblinka or fill in other experience here. So I think that that just kind of, you know, maybe it adds a backstory, looking at it in that localized context as you're bringing up there, it adds a backstory to individuals that we were only thinking of as, as people who perished in the Holocaust, perhaps. But at, some, at, you know, at another level, they have survived other things, whatever those might have been. And thanks for all those questions. Um, thank you, Chad. And I think um, Joanne here, um, Joanne Rudolph writes, that Fortunoff defines survivors as anyone who lived under Nazi occupation. Um, that's another addition. Um, I had a question for Julie um, also um, here. And um, my question was a little bit, if you could just expand a little bit about, right? Because, you know, at Fortunoff Archive, we have video testimonies and you're also kind of incorporating that with diaries. Um, so maybe just also, you know, both specifically about your research, but also generally working with these two different forms of um, of historical documentation, um, right? Where do you see the differences? What do you see? And what your perspective working on both with diaries and with um, video testimony? What is the difference and how differently do you think you approach and we should approach these types of, of, of testimony? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's a question I think about a lot, um, in particular with these diaries because they were found diaries and um, there are other diaries and 
first memoirs um, about Transnistria and even that take place in Romania and some of the post-war time, um, but they've been curated and redacted. And um, what for me is particularly unique about this source is um, its lostness. I mean, the fact that um, <clears throat> Actually, we also don't know what happened to the woman. I haven't been able to find her yet. As the project proceeds, uh, I used to think that, uh, well, I'm not going to focus on that because I have so many other things I need to focus on. But as it goes on, I'm finding that it seems very important to find out what happened to her afterwards, how, if there's any way of finding out what happened to her, and also how she views this period that I'm writing about, because a lot of these oral histories are, um, you know, they're, they are told sort of from a point of view of a happy ending, even though many of the people are traumatized for life and maybe they wouldn't, you know, that goes into the whole trauma thing, if you can have a happy ending after what was experienced. But, <clears throat> but nevertheless, um, the memoirs and oral histories talk about that a lot. How did you survive? What, did, what helped you do this? How did, why were you resilient? These words. And, um, you know, this is what we don't have from the from the diaries. We don't know if she ever, what, did she consider then that chapter of her life, just one chapter and she put it away and she moved on. Was she able to move, move on in some way? Um, I don't know. And to me, that is the biggest difference between these diaries specifically and, and the letters also. I didn't go into the letters, but the letters contain the biographical information that I provided. She writes them to her deceased loved ones and um, they are narrative and form and um, they uh, are different. They're more similar to the oral histories in that sense, except for that she did not write them to an audience or to what audience did she write them? So I don't know, I could talk on and on about this. It's actually an entire section of my project about sort of what was the, why did she write? For whom was she writing? I mean, she wanted the diaries to be kept. Um, she finds out about Anna Frank in the 50s and is very moved by this. So I think about that sometimes. But of course, she'd already been keeping the diaries for a long time. But she's extremely moved by, um, by the knowledge of that. And she, in general, was a writer. She wrote a screen book and tried to have it, uh, uh, sorry, um, screenplay, and tried to have it published. And so, yeah, these are all questions that I'm dealing with. Thank you. Um, if anyone has, thank you so much for your answer. And if anyone has any other um, questions, let me know. If not, we're just going to um, um, actually move for, on to the, our next presentation um, by uh, Professor uh, Wendy Lauer. Uh, I'll just, uh, shortly present um, Professor Lauer. Um, Wendy Lauer is the John K. Roth Professor of History and Director of the Center for Human Rights at Claremont uh, McKenna, uh, McKenna College. Um, um, Laura chairs the Academics Committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and serves as acting director of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mendel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, between she served uh, between 2016 and 2018. Um, and um, she um, was a German Research Foundation Fellow at Ludwig, Ludwig Maximilian Universität in Munich um, between 2007 and 2012, uh, where she introduced courses on the Holocaust, collected testimonies of prep perpetrators and bystanders and led an initiative to establish a federally funded German Center for Holocaust Studies at the Institute for Contemporary History. Um, and uh, Professor Lauer is the author of multiple books, um, which you can see uh, listed on her profile on her website. Um, among them, the most recent one is uh, The Ravine a Family a Photograph of Holocaust Massacre Revealed, uh, which you also presented about at Yale, um, I think about a month ago. Um, and I'm sure um, many of you have seen also the reviews um, in the press. Um, and I'll just um, let, um, Professor Lauer, um, start presenting. Thank you so much, Gil. Um, can you hear me and see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everybody on the team at the Fortune of Archive and our host, Stephen Naren and the McMillan Center. It's been a real honor to be the William Rosenberg Scholar this semester. Um, and I, I just, uh, you know, despite the limitations with COVID, we really enjoyed our time in New Haven and our visits to the, the library and our mining of the archives there. And I'm just incredibly uh, grateful for that and uh, hope that we can return at some point and do some more of this in person. 
So let me just get right down to my presentation. Um, I, I'm basically broken down into kind of seven sections. Don't be, I, I'm gonna <laughs> keep to my time. Um, but the way I've organized it is basically to start with um, Eric Hauser is the testimony I'm focusing on, his bio, his biography, then um, why I selected him um, and my kind of selection process and my research process, how I handled this uh, source um, and his testimony, and then delve into the content of his presentation, why he testified. I mean, he states so explicitly, and I listened to that and, and studied you know, what his rationale was and what stories he wanted to emphasize. Um, and then um, further uh, in, the, in the subsequent sections of, of, to look at some of the ideas that Lawrence Langer has presented um, as like frozen moments of anguish, as he puts it, um, memory of, of the senses. These were some of the elements of his testimony to me that, that popped out, that stood out, that I wanted to um, delve into. And then lastly, um, the material culture part of this or the performative part of this, how he presents things during his testimony, the objects he decides to bring um, into his story um, and the documents that he shares. Um, and then it's some concluding questions about the challenge of, as an historian, of annotating and contextualizing and um, what we mean by contextualization and um, the limits of that is, as well as the potential problems with over contextualizing um, and kind of decentering um, the, the survivor's uh, testimony um, as a result. So I'm, I'm kind of grappling with that balancing um, as well as ethical um, uh, endeavor as an historian. Okay, let me just tell you a little bit about Eric Hauser. Here he is, my screenshot of him from the um, uh, testimony that he, he gave. Um, he was born in 1908 in um, Grodek, Grodek Jagolonsky, Poland, which is now Horodok, uh, Ukraine. He had two siblings, younger siblings, uh, a sister and a brother. Um, Grodek's Gentile population at the time of his youth barred Jews from entering the trade guilds. And as a result, the Jewish community there was rather poor. But despite this, Isaac's family was well off. His father, Moses, was a contractor with his own business, and he built a lot of houses and issued mortgages to other Jewish families. And Isaac's grandfather, I'm referring to Isaac now, um, you know, interchanging that with Eric. He took the kind of American name Eric um, when he came, arrived uh, in America in 1949. So I will refer to him interchangeably as Isaac and Eric. So I hope that's not that confusing. So um, Isaac's grandfather was the head of the Jewish community and he was able to use his influence to place um, Isaac in the Catholic high school where he graduated valedictorian in 1926. Um, and the community itself from Grodek um, prioritized education. Most could read Polish and German and everyone read religious texts. And like other Jewish youth, Isaac had leftist and socialist leanings under Polish rule. As a Jew, Isaac was not accepted to a Polish university. He moved to Czechoslovakia to attend the Technical University in Bruno. And in 1931, he got a master's degree in electrical and mechanical engineering. This was going to be really important as far as his ability to survive that education. After completing his studies at the university, he returned to Poland. His degree was not recognized by the authorities and he had to take another exam. This is something he delves into in his presentation. Um, uh, he worked as an engineer and assistant manager for a Jewish owned oil field in Western Galicia. Um, and in 1939, uh, his family moved into a large house in Lvov. They moved into the city um, of Lvov, Lviv, Lviv um, Poland. Um, in September 39, with the start of the war, um, in accordance with the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, Germany invaded Western Poland, the Soviet army annexed Eastern Poland. Lvov was occupied and in, incorporated into the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, now part of the Russian dominated Soviet Union, no more into war, no, no longer into war Poland with the break of the destruction of Poland. So Isaac's um, a manager at this moment um, emptied most of the company's bank account and fled for America, leaving Isaac in charge of 220 employees and no payroll. His reputation among the employees prevented them from turning on him. Uh, shortly thereafter, as the Germans approached, Isaac was given orders to dismantle the oil wells and equipment to make them non-functional. Um, and he goes into a lot of detail in his testimony about the plants, the oil fields um, in Borislav, and the, you know he's really impressed with these these uh, the industrial 
um, materials there and the, the, the kind of modern features of those plants. Um, that he still he still kind of reminisces about that and his eyes uh, light up when he talks about it. So what, when they're dismantling these oil wells and they're hiding carburetors and trying to make them non-functional, this kind of sabotage to him, I think is kind of, is kind of painful, but necessary. Um, during the night, he took four other Jews and they tried to escape in a car um, that he had hidden nearby. He was very clever. Um, and he, they, they, but he was driving on some dark rough roads and he ended up crashing the car into a river. Um, they survived. Um, and his, this group that with the four other Jews, they managed to walk to the railroad station. Uh, they made it to, um, uh, uh, caught a train um, to Lvov. And the description there of the railroad station is really memorable as well of the German Stukas um, strafing and coming down and shooting, deliberately shooting into the windows of the um, railway cars and killing um, civilians. And, and that was the train they had to board and um, take to Lvov. Um, there, when he got to Lvov, uh, he met and married um, Louise Finkler. Um, so he would be with his wife throughout the um, war um, and survived with her. Um, he couldn't find work in Lvov, so he and his wife Louise headed 47 miles south to Borislav, um, where he had extended family. And he became the head of a mechanical and electrical department at the Borislav power plant um, and worked there as the head of a workshop. And Louise worked there as well. They were among 13,000 Jews of Borislav and subjected to severe restrictions and psychological abuse by the Soviets. In June 41, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union and occupied Borislav, a Ukrainian militia organized a violent pogrom against the Jewish population. Um, here's the location here to give you a little bit of a geographic orientation. This is from Thomas Zonkuller's book on the Endlösung in Galician. Um, here we have the city of Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov, um, um, Groduck here, this is where he was born and grew up, Isaac. Um, and he's making his way down here to the oil fields, the petroleum fields of Borislav, um, not far from um, Drohovich. Uh, the Ukrainian militia organized a violent pogrom against the Jewish population. Um, and the administration, German administration, soon authorized the establishment of a Jewish ghetto in Borislav near the end of November when they conducted their first organized action in the city, capturing and killing seven to 800 Jews. 30 members of Isaac's extended family were killed as a result. These actions against the population continued to take place every few months. And even though they had papers, um, Isaac had papers that they were, that were supposed to protect them, um, they still hid during the actions to avoid getting picked off um, on the streets. In 1942, Ukrainian and mounted German police surrounded um, his column marching to work and Isaac fled, jumping over a fence of an oil storage facility while being shot at. During another early action, he and his wife went to the house of a member of a Jewish militia who let them hide in his apartment. Other times they hid for days in partially flooded basements. Isaac also helped build an escape tunnel for Jews to hide, which they were able to construct without detection. In November 42, a forced labor camp was established for the 1,470 um, Jews who were working for the oil company um, in Borislav. And during that month, Isaac was issued an R badge, um, identifying him as a Rüstungsarbeiter. This was a very life-saving document. During the interview, he placed it, he, he has, still has the badge and he places it on his chest um, uh, in, this kind of, in this kind of gesture. It was uh, clear that this was an incredibly <laughs> important document for him that he kept. This pass allowed him to leave the camp to conduct technical work for the oil wells. Um, he had to pay bribes to officials, um, um, issuing um, another ID card that specified he was a specialized engineer. This profession obviously was important for the war effort. Um, authorities continued to kill and transport Jews to concentration camps, and they completed the liquidation of the Borislav ghetto or they, um, in June 43. So in this last phase of, um, of the war in April 44, as the Germans were doing these final, completing these final liquidations and the Soviet army began advancing towards Borislav, Isaac believed that the Germans would kill the remaining Jews. And so he forged a pass, another document for his wife and they were able to escape the camp. And for six weeks, they hid in the attic of a Ukrainian peasant um, alongside 16 other people. Borislav was liberated by the Soviet army on August 7th. After liberation, Isaac was able to acquire Polish papers for Louise and himself and they were permitted to cross the border into Poland. They went back to Lvov where Isaac's family had been forced from the Lvov ghetto into the Yanovska street camp. 
and his family was probably killed there in 1943 when the ghetto and the camp were destroyed and the city was declared free of Jews. The couple then traveled to Munich where Isaac acquired a job with the World Wart Union um, as the director of the vocational school there with 2000 students. Um, he provided training courses to survivors to help them rebuild their lives in new countries. And in 1947, Isaac and Louise gave deposits for the court proceedings against the police and Gestapo in Boroslav and Drohovich. Isaac and Louise lived in Munich until emigrating to the United States in October 1949, where they, when they changed their names to Eric and Louise and settled in New York. Here's an image of the oil fields in Boroslav where they worked. I'm sorry, this is a bit blurry. This was the orphanage he mentions in his um, testimony. So um, let me tell you a little bit about my um, selection process. And, and, and here's the document that he, his testimony that he gave, I mentioned um, in Munich um, to, to the off, at the Office of Liberated Jews in 1947, which was as held in the um, Sterling Memorial, part of the collection of the Fortuna archive there that I was able to, to study as well. Um, well, I started out looking at survivors of wartime Ukraine, today's borders, because I'd worked on Ukraine and I thought, well, that would be a good foundation. And then I, um, and I looked at those, the ones that actually were in English, this, this testimony um, Hauser gave in English. And his testimony really uh, was outstanding for me because of the vivid um, memories uh, uh, that he presented um, the, the image I described to you of the German planes um, uh, firing into the trains, um, the fact that he, he was able to provide that kind of empirically rich detail, specific names and places of people he interacted with, of Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, Germans, and fellow Jews. Um, identifying the worst perpetrators in the region, I, I, and many of those names were familiar to me, and I knew some of them were very obscure, um, not that well known in the literature, and yet he was calling them out. Uh, for um, like um, one of the chiefs, chiefs I wrote about in Hitler's Furies, actually, is the uh, husband and wife in, in Drohobich, the blocks. Um, also, we had this supporting documentation, this testimony that's on the screen here from 1947, which you know would open up another um, uh, possibilities for research to kind of corroborate those names and to look into those uh, war crimes um, cases. His uh, the fact that he covered kind of each chapter of his life, his youth in Poland. Um, he described the inter-ethnic tensions of Poles and Ukrainians and Jews and how that was aggravated and exploited by the Soviet and Nazi occupiers. Um, he was candid about some of the most cruel and shameful behavior, including um, crimes committed by Jews, uh, sexual violence. There's, it, you know, he just, um, there were no taboos in the way that he um, presented his, his account. Um, and the clarity of his purpose. He said, I'm giving my testimony and or he would stop and kind of cue the, the audience, you know, um, pay attention to this, you know. Um, but also the fact that, you know, he was not um, in his straightforward um, accounts, you know, he, there were a lot of, it was very emotional as well. And he would stop you know, the kinds of gestures on the screen, the, the pauses, the coughs, um, the, the downward glances, sometimes he holds up the paper and kind of hides behind the paper as he's talking because he's getting, um, uh, 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 his eyes are welling up and when he, what he says, moments when he becomes overcome. Um, and the themes that are in his storytelling of gender, the sexual violence, the attention to women's history, the attention to class, talking about what he calls the Klondike laborers and the oil fields that he managed, the drill masters, the welders, the blacksmiths, the rough types, he said, who were eager to fight, whom the Russians broke and turned into ants and lambs and informers. Um, his descriptions of race and the hierarchies, uh, the Nazi ladder that he talked of related privileges and deprivations that were determined by race. So my process of, of going through um, his, his testimony was um, you know, um, multi-pronged in a way. Um, first, I listened to it, um, you know, and I was stopping and, and uh, taking notes, put, inserting footnotes um, and various annotations. And then I would put my own remarks in about his manners and his gestures and facial expressions. I basically combined the, the Christopher Browning approach of triangulation of testimony with other sources and various 
tests of say probability and veracity and logic. I checked um, his uh, stories and some of his, the names and places and, and accounts against um, secondary literature, um, Dieter Pohl's work, Thomas Zonkuller, Tim Snyder's work, uh, uh, Kai Struve, um, Mick, Jean-Paul Himka, of course. Um, then I checked the um, trial records for the perpetrators that he identified. Um, and um, many of them uh, were indicted uh, in a case in Bremen and also an important case that's uh, occurred in Austria, um, waiting to get that indictment actually from the Wiener Library. Um, I went into the ITS records and found his name on various lists um, from the World Jewish Congress. Um, yeah, I also tried to find his descendants. I, I tried to, I found the Hauser family in New York, but it was Buffalo, New York, not Rigo Park. I found the wrong Hauser family, another family of uh, descendants of survivors. Um, I talked to actually yesterday in Buffalo, New York, but not the right one. Um, so I'm trying to uh, pursue that as well. So I combined this empirical approach with what kind of Noah Schenker and Han, Hank Greenspan stressed in their work on listening and reframing Holocaust testimony with special attention on the performative aspects because of course, this is a video account. And I was inspired as well by what the founders of the Fortune of Archive envisioned um, that is a collection of voices that effectively, uh, effectively and uh, effectively um, created a provisional community bound by memory and the recognition of trauma. So I wanted to be conscious of the manner in which the testimonies were collected the stories, uh, how they are told of, of human suffering, and then the history that is then um, created as a result or conveyed and, and received. In Noah Schenker's book, Reframing Holocaust Testimony, it makes an interesting distinct, distinction between uh, or among chronologically charted testimonies, on the one hand, the redemptive cathartic version, a kind of dialectic with the interviewer, and then um, the third, what uh, he refers to as these testimonies that, that contain, um, in Langer's words, frozen moments of anguish. And this is what Hauser called in his own self-effacing way, moments when as he stated at the end of his interview, quote, I cannot collect myself sometimes so well, one is overcome. So I was interested in this um, on a more conceptual side, the storytelling that the ruptures, the unsettled moments, not the usual digressions that we talk about um, in history writing, but as Schenker states, those both shattering and unifying impulses. So why did um, our, our subject, uh, Isaac Hauser, why did he um, testify? Uh, first of all, the pursuit of justice. Here, I've had this slide up for a while. Um, the list of names was rather astounding. You can, if you can read this German document, it's also an English um, translation. Of, of, the, of the killers and distinguishing between the Gestapo and the Schupo and um, had, you know, was, had a really, um, uh, had retained that information and deliberately during the war um, documented that and then immediately went or, you know, went to the um, Liberated Jews Commission in Munich to, to provide that information. Um, secondly, um, he stated, the reason I do this interview only, I would like to show that the Russians uh, broke our spirit in a way um, there, well, the Germans killed us physically. So there are a couple of occasions where he compares the Germans and the Russians. Um, and of course, in this um, period in the literature, especially Timothy Snyder's work, among others of this notion and the politicization of the double occupation or the entanglement of the Soviet um, Nazi systems. And it's in his testimony, it became clear to me that this entanglement, it's, that, that kind of characterization is maybe not entirely correct, and certainly not this notion of a binary of a double occupation that can be compared as worse um, or better, both qualitatively or quantitatively. But instead, um, Eric or Isaac, um, he describes what he calls the kind of Russian cure, um, and describe it very quickly in a moment, um, as um, part of the, the radicalization. Um, uh, and I guess Snyder would go back to 1933 to show how this kind of um, occurs over time. Uh, but uh, the way that um, the Russians treated the, you know, in this first phase was so demoralizing um, uh, as he describes it. Um, he says, I'm quoting now, um, 
we didn't, my reason for appearance today is I wanted to make sure, I don't know if I did to stress the point that we should have resisted much more strongly than we did, we as in the Jews. And we didn't because the Russians have conditioned it to us. The Russians with their preceding occupation have changed us into a bunch of low animals. I don't know, probably lower than rats because I read that when rats are pushed towards the wall, they will rear up their legs and they will show their teeth and they will try to bite. The Russians have methods and the best proof is right in the Russian history of the last 40 years. The Germans were murderous. This is all well known. There's no secret to it. The Russian role in our calamity um, uh, is not as well known. They didn't, li they didn't liberate us. We survived because of some skill, of some good luck, of some happy coincidence. I, helped the, I think the Russians helped kill us. My father was a very strong man. He was a building contractor, but they, wrote, they broke his spirit. They came in. He wasn't permitted. They came into our house. He took our house. Every night they came to try to arrest him. Every night he slept on the roof because he, he wouldn't go up on the roof to look. Um, it, just describing this incredibly um, demoralizing uh, uh, period uh, preceding the German, German occupation that ultimately created this situation, um, frozen moments of anguish, um, quoting Langer here. And in, in Hauser's reflections about the fate of his family, um, here he, he describes how his father uh, at the moment of, of the onset of the war in 39 with the bombs falling, that his father just became so focused on his work. That was his uh, identity, that was his, his dignity. Um, he says, my father was building a huge house for Poland. It was a huge house, a four-story house in the city of Lemberg. He finished building it as the first bombs were falling in Lemberg in 1939. What is interesting for my father that he paid his debts. He was convinced his worth is as good. And then this is when he starts to get choked up and he stops and he gets, he looks down, he starts to scratch his chin. And then he kind of smiles a little bit that his worth is as good as gold. While the bombs were falling, he paid his debts. And, and then he describes how the Russians completely um, broke the spirit of his father. Um, but there's, there's a kind of critique of his father's reaction um, to the war and the first bombs falling. Um, and a kind of irony there as far as his continue, you know, wanting to focus on work and not realizing the gravity um, of the situation. And then secondly, when um, Eric is fleeing with um, with his wife to Borislav when they realize they need to get out of Lvov. Um, he runs back during the pogrom and his family is sitting together, including you know, his sister and his brothers, younger sister and brother. And he says, I went in, my family was there. I told them disperse, there is something vicious going on. And they said, no, we sit together. We feel better when we sit together. And so they sat together, they all died together. I ran away and I hid out. And so it's this, um, kind of frustration that he um, seems to communicate about not being able to rescue his, you know, save his family and convince them to, to, to leave. And he doesn't see them again after that. He, um, and he assumes that they died in Yanovska. And I'm gonna show you uh, how that kind of follows through into the rest of his biography, um, not knowing kind of their, their ultimate fate, really. I mean, what, ha what, what happened to them after um, he left um, in those intervening years. Um, I don't know if I have that much time. How much time do I have left? Um, we're a little bit over time, so if you can okay. just uh, okay, yeah. then I'm gonna then I'm gonna skip through this. Um, I just want to point out here we can't read all this. Um, the other element of the testimony having to do with the memory of the senses and being attuned to um, uh, expressions of of set of sound, of sight, of smell. The fact that he describes here. Um, in his, um, one of his intentions was to, to, to show the total brutalization that occurred. So he has vivid descriptions of the, of the violence. Um, and here's a German official uh, who is, um, ki kills this Jewish boy, um, 12 to 13 year old boy uh, who's already wounded. And the SS man says, oh, at some, there's a discussion. Should we leave this child in peace? Um, uh, the kid is afraid. And then the more brutal German says, Zola learning, cried the first one. He should learn. Now that is something he should learn. Um, Zola learning. And then Isaac Hauser says, it sounds in my ears. And they, um, they kind of finish off that child. Um, and a similar kind of 
uh, way of storytelling where he says, I have to say, I saw this, I saw this. And that's the uh, other account on the right that has to do with the sexual violence, the rape of a Jewish woman in his office by a, a Jewish uh, coworker. These are uh, snapshots here or still uh, screenshots of the documents that he presents during his interview that I uh, wanted to pay attention to. And then lastly, this is a prisoner bowl that he um, brought to the Holocaust Museum. So I checked where Eric Hauser might have donated things or given testimony to other institutions. And this was given in 1990 after, after his 1985 testimony, why he didn't have the bowl at this, you know, at this moment, um, but his papers is a question um, that I thought was interesting, but he ended up donating this bowl. It's a bowl he found when he went to the Yanovska camp in search of his family. Um, there's no, it didn't you know, belong to his family. It's just kind of symbolic. It's what he has left of his family. Um, so my concluding questions have to do with the critical edition and how do I bring this all together as far as both the performative, um, the kind of sensory aspects of his uh, storytelling and the deep memory, um, and then the contextualization of that as a story and the more empirical uh, side of that. And how far do I go with that um, without kind of diminishing his um, story or do I fill in his gaps of memory? Um, and how far do I go with that in my introduction and my annotation? And I open that, uh, end with that, and I invite your questions. I welcome them. I'm looking forward to your reactions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Um, thank you so much for your um, for talk. Um, I'm going to present um, the next talk, and then we'll take some questions um, at the end. And feel, please feel free to write them in the Q&A um, box. Um, so our next speaker um, is uh, Jonathan Petropoulos. Um, who is the John V. Kroll Professor of European History at Claremont McKenna College in Southern California. Um, between, two th between 1998 and 2000, Dr. Petropoulos, Professor Petropoulos served as research director for art and culture property on the Presidential Commission on Holocaust Assets in the United States, where he helped um, draft the report Restitution and Plunder, the U.S. and Holocaust Victims Assets. Um, he also provided uh, expert testimony to the select Committee on Cultural Media, uh, culture, media, and sports in the UK House of Commons and to the Banking and Finance Committee of the US House of Representatives um, regarding these issues. He's the author of multiple books, which you can um, read about on his profile page and our website. Among them, most recently, uh, Goring's Men in Paris, The Story of a Nazi Art Plunderer and His World, uh, which was published by Yale University Press. Um, and I'll let um, you speak. Thank you, Gail, for that very gracious uh, introduction. And thanks to Stephen Neron and Timothy Snyder, uh, Christy Bailey Tomachek, and all the, the folks at the Fortunoff Video um, Testimony Archive. Um, it's been a, it was a wonderful semester on sabbatical, such an honor. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Sidney Bruskin. And I would mention, um, I selected him because of my next project. Um, I'm writing a book along with Wendy Lauer about 1945 and uh, war's end and what happens to some of the Nazi leaders. And, uh, and Sidney Bruskin's story fit into that, that project. I had considered uh, doing a testimony involving Nazi looted art, which has been my specialty, but I found that Bruskin's testimony was very rich and took me in a direction I wanted to go. So Bruskin is an interesting figure. He's a son of Jewish immigrants. He's a New Haven lad. Uh, a Yale graduate, uh, a member of the counterintelligence corps that arrested French collaborators and Nazi war criminals. He was a liberator of a concentration camp and a person whose wartime experiences shaped his faith and his identity. Um, Bruskin was interviewed in 1994, um, which was rather early for interviewing veterans. Um, Saving Private Ryan, the film came along in 1998, and that led to uh, a kind of a collective project to interview the greatest generation. Um, Congress uh, uh, passed a bill uh, starting an interview, a federal project to interview uh, veterans. And in the first 10 years, they interviewed over 65,000. Um, but Bruskin's is earlier, and uh, but it does fit into that trope of, of, of uh, veterans' interviews. Um, and I should also mention that I found in the Yale University archives uh, an interview that Bruskin did nine years later in 2003 as part of a New Haven oral history project. And he was interviewed by a local high school student and reflected on his, his years growing up in New Haven. And, and that was useful for the first part of the annotation. 
education. Um, so as I mentioned, Bruskin was the son of immigrants. Uh, his father and mother arrived in 1907 and 1909, respectively, from Russia. And uh, his father was a barber. His mother was a dressmaker. And, uh, and so Bruskin is part of a broader immigration process or pattern. You know, between 1881 and 1914, over 1.5 million Russian Jews fled persecution in Tsarist Russia. Um, as you probably know that there were pogroms in the early 1880s and then between 1903 and 1906. And scholars say um, generally that the early pogroms didn't precipitate so much immigration, but the 1903 to 1906 ones did. And there's one scholar, Yanai Spitzer, who wrote, Jewish migration from the Russian Empire to the United States in the years 1881 to 1914 was one of the most intense mass population movements in history. Over a single generation, more than a quarter of Jewish Russian of the Jewish Russian population was resettled overseas. Seas. The Russian Empire was home to some 5.3 million Jews in 1897, approximately half of world's Jewry. So I think to see Bruskin as part of that process was for me rather rather interesting. Um, also, um, the let's see if we get this. The, the, uh, the assimilation in New Haven and what it said about the, the local history of New Haven was to me very interesting. As many of you know, in, in New Haven, it was called Copper City because of the important uh, trades in heavy machinery and manufacturing. And so you see these immigrants coming in, uh, in as part of the Industrial Revolution. And so this the story of assimilation to me was, was quite interesting. Uh, Bruskin went to Hill House High School, still there, but it's changed his demographic markedly. Um, and he, he was raised in a very secular uh, Jewish family, and I'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of my presentation. Um, very smart, very clever, and he was admitted to Yale, and he uh, matriculated from 1932 to 1936. And of course, this was a period with numerous clauses, right? In 1935, Yale accepted 76 applicants from a pool of 501. About 200 of those applicants were Jewish, five got in, right? Uh, and there was a quote from a dean at the time, Dean Milton Winterhitz, and he said, never admit more than five Jews, take only two Italian Catholics and take no blacks at all. And this, did, this continued through the 1960s. Um, this is quite well known. Uh, there was a limit, uh, a quota of about 10%. Um, Dan Oren, uh, a 1979 Yale uh, graduate, wrote a book that's um, been well recognized, Joining the Club. And, and so Sidney Bruskin you know, embodied this. Right. He he actually lived at home. Um, uh, uh, Jews and Christians at uh, Yale were segregated until 1948, uh, and he didn't have enough money to, to live on campus. So he lived at home and he was socially isolated uh, in this way. And it was very interesting what, you know, his experiences there. I love the story of the first time he had a ham sandwich. I was teased into it because I wasn't supposed to, but I could see some of the guys were, some of the Jewish boys were eating ham sandwiches. So I said, all right, here goes. I took it and I said, oh boy, I'm probably going to drop dead, but I survived. Um, but more important with you know, less levity, uh, he noted, we Jewish boys accepted the fact that there was a sort of, we were sort of outcasts, not exactly outcasts, but we were at the, uh, at the edge. We accepted that and we didn't do anything about it. We didn't protest. So um, Bruskin at Yale, he mentored in, majored in French languages, uh, French and other Romance languages, uh, Italian, he had some German, he learned some Yiddish later on. And I found this to be very interesting. Interesting. It reminded me of what George Steiner said. Uh, George Steiner was born in 1929 to Viennese parents who had left Austria and gone to Paris. And his father, uh, who had raised the family, the children multilingual, said that he believed Jews were endangered guests wherever they went and equipped his children with languages. In the Steiner household, it was German, French, and English. But it's, you know, it's, it wasn't clear with Bruskin if this was one of the things he was thinking about, that this would be helpful. But he loved these languages, and it 
proved uh, important in his subsequent and subsequent developments. Um, when he graduated in 1936, he didn't have good job prospects in the depression, but uh, through complicated circumstances, he stumbled into a bike business. Um, interesting, he could not even ride a bike and I wondered about that, why he couldn't, um, but he was able to open a shop on Chapel Street. And um, I went to look for the, for the shop, his bicycle shop, and I couldn't find it. And a little bit more research, I realized what had happened. It was torn down in 1961, and it was replaced by the uh, the school, the Yale School of Architecture, um, that controversial building, that brutalist architecture. Uh, architectural historian Elizabeth Mills Brown had said, this building has probably caused more furor than any other American architectural work of the mid 20th century, a storm center from the start, praised as the prophet of a new architecture, damned as willful and egocentric, dogged by misadventure, victim of arson, student vandalism, remodeling, an endless complaint, the a and &A building has a bitter and embattled career. So um, that's what happened to Sidney Bruskin's bike shop. Um, he had married and, uh, and so he was not uh, immediately drafted. And I talk a little bit about the, about conscription, the first peacetime conscription in American history in 1940. Uh, he had a daughter uh, and that also delayed his induction into the military, but by 1943 he was he was uh, uh, drafted. Uh, went through basic training in uh, Camp Shelby, Fort Shelby down in Mississippi, and then at Fort Devens up in Massachusetts. And then he was shipped to England, um, not knowing exactly what he was going to do. Um, and here is Sidney Bruskin as a as a private shortly after uh, finishing um, basic training and, and such. And in in the UK, uh, the Counterintelligence Corps was looking for individuals individuals with language skills. Um, there was a, a dire shortage of individuals who could speak European languages. And so Bruskin had his opportunity with his language skills. And so he became a member of the counterintelligence corps of the 80th division. And uh, he started well, he, he, he arrived at uh, in France on D-Day plus 30 at Omaha Beach, right? So one month after D-Day in, in early July, 19, 1944. And he was in his cohort were given lists uh, of Nazi uh, officials and their job was to go search for them. And the, the lists were published after the war. And when I was writing Goering's Man in Paris about Bruno Loza, this was part of the list, just to give it a sense. They had a thick volume uh, of high ranking Nazis, including the Ortsgruppenleiter, the local officials, and, and they would go pursue uh, pursue the Nazis. They started off actually with French collaborators, um, and that was kind of a training for Bruskin as he would learn to interrogate uh, informants and to, to work with local resistance and to ply his trade. But um, he really became much more aggressive when they went into Germany, into Austria uh, later on. And, and probably the high point for Bruskin certainly was a high point in terms of hunting for Nazis was in Althausé, uh, a small town in the Salzkammergut. Um, and I had spent quite a bit of time in Althausé myself. It's really right where the U.S. zone is here. It's not too far from Salzburg, but it's in the middle of the Austrian Alps there. And Althausé had been a repository for uh, artworks, uh, including uh, Hitler's collection, over 4,500 pictures um, in, in the Fuhrer Museum were there, and many other looted works. Uh, there had been drama there at war's end as the local Gauleiter, I Gruber, had ordered bombs to be placed in the entrance to the mine, and it took an act of resistance, the local miners, to, to, to pull them out and defuse the bombs, and uh, here they are with some American uh, soldiers who, who've come in, the first to arrive, uh, and of course there was a long process of evacuating the mines. In the Monumentsman film, they do it in one afternoon, and in fact it took them four months to do so. Uh, the roads were impassable. Um, so in Althausé, though, besides looted artworks, one found an array of high-ranking Nazis, from Ernst Kaltenbrunner to Adolf Eichmann to Otto Skorzeny, uh, uh, August Eigruber, the Gauleiter, was there, Hugo Jury, Franz Stangl was there, the Sobibor Treblinka camp commander, Anton Burger, the head of, of you get the point, it was just filthy with Nazis, and so that's where, where Bruskin and his partner Robert Matson arrived, and I should also mention, I had gone and found old Nazis in Althausé too, in the 1990s and early 2000s, I had interviewed Wilhelm Hutto uh, and some others there, so uh, it's still a place that has a brown past, if you 
you will. Um, so Bruskin, he played a key role in arresting I. Gruber, the Gauleiter, and specifically I. Gruber's wife. Uh, that was Bruskin alone. Um, but uh, uh, and this is this is this is Bruskin in his interview uh, to the left. I know it's very blurry as a screenshot, but um, gives you a sense how they they were just finding uh, local facilities and turning them into prisons and arresting these these people. Um, the highlight of his uh, you know, activity in hunting for Nazis was arresting Ernst Kaltenbrunner, uh, the head of the Reich Security Main Office. And Kaltenbrunner had a villa uh, there I mentioned earlier. It was filled with treasure. Over 60 kilos of gold was found there. Most of it disappeared. But he took flight uh, as the Americans arrived and he went into the deep wilderness there up into, into the Alps. And uh, and reports came in that that Kaltenbrunner was probably up there in, in the in the Interlands. And so Robert Matson, uh, Bruskin's partner took, partner, took the lead. He was very gung-ho, if you will, and he put on Austrian hunting gear attire. He found some local Austrians who were had been in the Wehrmacht, but were now prepared to help. And along with some American GIs, they hiked all night for seven hours over snow and ice and found Kaltenbrunner and his adjutant, uh, Major Scheidel, uh, in this, this hut there. And uh, it was a very tense standoff, but they managed to arrest Kaltenbrunner without, without firing shots. He claimed to be a physician and to be someone else. Uh, Bruskin was back with Kaltenbrunner's mistress, uh, a, an aristocrat uh, who had just given birth to twins, Kaltenbrunner. Brunner's twins and uh, and uh, uh, Scheidel's wife was also there. So when they marched these two people back into Altaize and Bruskin had the women there, he was keeping them uh, under under guard. They ran to their to their romantic partners and they embraced them. So that was the form of identification with the with the women showing who they actually were. And it was interesting how how this was such a high point in Bruskin's career. For Matson too, uh, he wrote a book about arresting Carlton Brunner and would lecture and and uh, they they the, they they kept souvenirs, if you will, trophies from their experience. Uh, Matson kept the identity badge of Carlton Brunner, and Arthur Scheidler's went to Bruskin, which he still had, and he was holding up uh, as a symbol. He also brought back Scheidler's rifle, which he sold in the 1990s for four hundred dollars, and that was kind of interesting in its way. Um, also, besides arresting Carlton Brunner and I Gruber and some of these others, um, Bruskin went to Abenze, right? And this is a photo that he took upon arrival. And uh, Abenze is a subcamp of Matthausen. Uh, it, it really uh, came into existence uh, about halfway through the war um, in 1943. It, it held about 28,000 male inmates and about 11,000 of them had died in the camp. And Bruskin's testimony is interesting here, right? He says, on our way, Bob Matson picked me up in Kempton, Bavaria, actually Baden Vortenberg, but, and we were on our, going on our down to, to Alze. On the way, we had heard that there was a concentration camp, Abense, which was not far from Alt Alze. So we drove there. When we got there, there were, Bob wrote a book and I have at home, a sort of pamphlet. He claims that we broke the lock to get in there. I say definitely, I say that we were among the first troops there. I remember going through this gate and there were a few soldiers there, very few. So whether Bob Manson broke the gate to get into Abe and say or not, we're not quite sure. Um, but you know, this was the, the, the scene that Bruskin and Matson encountered there uh, you know, as liberators. And there's some fascinating accounts of um, the liberation there as the Americans, well, subsequent to Bruskin and, and, and Matson arriving, the American army arrived in Panzers and they drove in. And the, the discussion was, was how the Americans were uh, looking at the inmates as if they came from a different planet that they were hardly recognizable. And same with the inmates looking at the Americans. Some of the inmates tried to climb up on the Panzers on the tanks and the Americans gently but firmly you know, pushed them down and said, no, we have to keep away. Um, they brought up one or two prisoners and gave them lucky strikes and said, tell us what's going on here. So a couple who could speak English. And they were, you know, getting a sense of what happened. Um, there was an interesting episode when they went found the kitchen uh, there that the cook there wanted to give the American liberators uh, some uh, some food and serve them the soup, and the Americans didn't didn't want to do so, and they were told that it would be rude not to accept this you know, act of generosity. So they were given bowls and they took a couple soup spoons of the of the broth, and of course they said it tasted wretched, it was terrible. But this very interesting moment of of 
in, encounter between the American liberators and the camp inmates. Um, quite a few of them died from the refeeding syndrome that I think you all know about there. So th there's an interesting moment uh, uh, with Bruskin um, as he as he uh, experiences this, this concentration camp. Um, there was a crematorium there and above the crematorium was this sign. It was a little poem about the bodies wanting to be burned and returning to nature. And uh, Bruskin ordered uh, an inmate, he said it was a capo who was tall and well-fed to tear it, to bring down the sign. And, and he did. And Bruskin carried the sign all the way back uh, to America. And he put um, this notation on his copy. He donated the originals to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, right? But this was another War trophy, right? The crematorium sign that that he that he brought back, and I thought that was interesting. What he was carrying all over Europe for the next um, next six months. Um, eventually, Bruskin went to Nuremberg, and he was part of the team of interpreters that worked there. Um, his German was not good enough for him to be an interpreter for Kaltenbrunner for a major war criminal, but criminal. But he was part of the the broader interrogation process, and then uh, came home in late 1945. Um, at this early on in the Nuremberg trials, um, this was another. Um, uh, photograph that he made in a Jewish cemetery and, and he kept, this is himself there. And one thing that I found was really striking about this testimony, um, well, I'll let the, this, this, this um, quotation here, right? Uh, but it changed my whole outlook, going to Europe and hunting Nazis and liberating Abense on everything. I had never had much of a Jewish upbringing. We never belonged to a synagogue. I didn't have a bar mitzvah and so forth, but that changed completely. No, no, I went back to my roots after seeing particularly the, the, the camp and the women in Ludwigshafen and so forth. And he had seen um, victims in Ludwigshafen on Lake Constance as well. When I came back, I decided that I was going to become a Jew boy again. I didn't know how to start. And then I got a letter from the Lodge B'nai Brith inviting me to a breakfast. And any group that approached me at that point, they were going to get me. I signed up right away because I figured this way I could identify myself as Jewish. And with Sidney Bruskin and, and looking for um, what happened to him after the war, he shows up in the New Haven and the Hamden Jewish communities, and he's he's participating in dinners and, and other kind of uh, community events and such. And, and uh, Wendy and I, we went and found Sidney Bruskin's grave, uh, gravestone, uh, his last resting place in the Michigan Israel Cemetery there, right? So it was interesting to see uh, someone who had focused so much early on in assimilation and being an American and um, you know, going to Yale and then you know, the experience of the war, um, which shaped him so, so, so profoundly. So, um, so yes, yeah, so um, I, mine is still very much a work in progress. Um, I had hope, also hoped to find uh, relatives of Sidney Bruskin, and I was calling Bruskins around the country. Uh, we can see from this gravestone behind that he has children and grandchildren, but I have yet to, to find them. So um, I'm going to continue to work on my testimony in the coming weeks and coming months. Um, it'll be done this summer. Um, but hopefully I can find some family members and get that perspective as well. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating talk and for fascinating um, two talks here. I'm going to start actually reading out um, the first question and please um, um, everyone, please write to us um, with your uh, questions for um, uh, Professor Lauer and Professor Petropoulos. Um, so Lawrence, Lawrence Langer asked, um, he writes here for the sake of accuracy, Memory of the senses is Charlotte Delbo's language, which I borrowed. My question to Wendy is, is anything lost from the impact of the personal ordeal of the survivor by such extensive contextualization? This is a question from a non-historian, not a criticism. Well, I think, you know, I'd be curious to hear from others on this as well, um, on how to think about, you know, is there a balance to be uh, achieved or aware of? Um, it just, it just struck me as I was embarking on the critical edition and looking at the typical kinds of introductions. And I introduced a diary that I published uh, years ago as well. Um, the, as an historian, you know, I have this um, compulsion. I have this uh, uh, routine of, as well of, of trying to, you know, check the facts and, and, and fill out the history and, and tell the story of the Holocaust in Borislav and tell the story of the Holocaust in Galicia. Um, but that kind of adding that kind of apparatus, that kind of 
um, either however you want to put it, grounding or, or introduction, you know, at what point does that then diminish the, the power of the story of, of the survivor, um, you know, as you put it, the, the impact of that, because that's the subjectivity of that and, the, and those um, frozen moments of anguish, for instance, um, in and of themselves are so, so revealing. So I, that's, I don't have really a direct answer to your question because as I concluded, you know, um, how do we deal with annotation and kind of traumatic autobiographies that contain these ruptures and unsettled moments? Do we fill in those gaps? Um, you know, do we add layers of, do we add to the layers of personal memory, another layer of official history? Um, and, you know, how much is, is, n- useful um, uh, and, and illuminating and supportive of, um, of that testimony of that survivor's, um, not diminishing that survivor's voice. So, I mean, I'd like to hear from Gil and some of the other participants on this issue if they've thought about it in any way. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna actually tie this to maybe something, um, if people wanna ask any additional questions here, um, but I wondered if um, you wanna tie this a little bit about um, a question I received, uh, for Jonathan, um, also somebody just wrote me, but um, if um, if you're gonna kind of maybe kind of discuss this and kind of discuss um, also your previous work on looted art um, in relation to this and just see, just a question about um, how does this relate to um, Fortunoff testimonies and if you can see if any of the Fortunoff testimonies you think add to that in, in some way, it's one of the questions, sorry. So for, this is for me about- yes. Yeah, and I'll connect also to Wendy's question in a minute. Um, sorry, I was just- so no, I'm, I'm glad that um, the question was posed because um, it goes back to the process by which I arrived at Sydney Bruskin, and um, you know I, I, I look through the Fortunoff archives to, for looted art and any references of art, and it, it was striking how art came up frequently uh, as part of people's lives. And, and some of the individuals had been artists or they had, they had family members who were artists. Um, they had art collections. And, and um, what, I, what I took away from reading those testimonies was something I had sensed before and, and, and you know, read about before, but it was really palpable in the testimonies is how art is, uh, different from most kinds of assets and that it's so personal. Um, it, it's such a part of people's lives. And, and, and so, you know, people live with artworks in proximity, they're passed down from generation to generation. And, and so I did see um, that come to life as people talked about family portraits that were missing and collections that had disappeared. And, and so to see that um, animated and such was, was, was striking, um, you know, with, with Sidney Bruskin, um, you know, it was the objects that he brought back and the way he treated them. And I think Wendy talked about these too, what, what Hauser kept, you know, they had a kind of a special power. They were talismans. And the fact that he had held onto Major Scheidel's identification badge for 50 years was sort of, you know, was interesting and, and I think representative, but, but it was almost, you know, Bruskin sensed a kind of evilness that was there. And, and, and this was almost something magical that he had, you know, he, that he wasn't going to protect him, but it had a certain aura to it and a quality and he was fascinated with it. So I think this notion about objects and auras um, is really, really interesting to me and connects both the Nazi memorabilia objects and the, the looted artwork, the artworks that people lived with. And um, back to um, what Wendy said, um, and I'll maybe open it also, um, if you have other questions, but also to Julian Chad, I mean, because I think it's a great question. I'm thinking about what does it mean to is there is there all is there a risk there of over contextualizing is there's too extensive contextualizing what does that mean um, for the personal experience um, of the survivor um, right because we use the, the 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 contextualization to to put the survivor in a different story um, than the one that he or she may be wanting to tell um, so I'm wondering also if, if this is something that um, Chad and Julie or Jonathan you also want to address um, how that um, kind of that tension is something that you might think about or deal with in, in, in the way you're, you're approaching testimonies? I don't know how to answer this yet, but I think there's there's one interesting book I read recently um, and reviewed that uh, might offer some tips. The, Ava Noak Mosse's um, recently published memoir of the last days of Theresienstadt. Mm-hmm. Um, in that, it's, it's a memoir that she wrote 
you might think of it as a diary that she wrote as as she was in Theresienstadt. And then she went back and tried to mediate her own diary. And the press attempted to place all of her, her post-war editions, all of her additions to the book that were not contemporaneous. They tried to put all of those in, in italics. Um, but if you go through it with a fine tooth comb, you realize there's a lot more mediation there than, than they were able to catch in the italics. And it's kind of just, it's a fascinating book. It's, it's almost like uh, it presupposes these edited testimonies, right? Because it, it's it's the survivor doing it themselves. It's the it's the individual who experienced this, trying to mediate their own early um, testimony of those events, and it's difficult to pick apart. Uh, really difficult to pick apart what they knew at the time and what they didn't. But um, fascinating in the attempt, at least. And you raise an interesting point about survivors themselves, and you know the the earlier. Um, approach in, in reading these and listening to these testimonies was more historical, really. I think um, Fortunoff, you know, made huge strides in shifting attention to the stories of suffering in and of themselves and to study the trauma and to study, and to listen to those voices in and of themselves and the subjectivity of them. Um, but then it's, yes, you have the other phenomenon of the survivor who adds his or her own contextualization and pulls out history books while they're narrating their own autobiography and don't get it right all the time or kind of it, you know, they don't tell us their own personal stories. They tell us kind of what is kind of common, common memory versus their own um, deeper memory. So um, it can happen both, you know, by scholars as well as by the survivors themselves. Yeah. I mean, when, when looking at, at a testimony, I'm reminded of something that one of my professors actually in England said to me, um, and he said, historians, you know, we engage in lumping and splitting. And, and so with testimonies, I, you know, clearly we want something that's representative uh, and we can, you know, uh, gain insight into, into uh, you know, events that affected many more people, but we also want to do that. The splitting and preserve what is unique in the individual, right? And and to have a voice and have an experience that's that's exceptional. So it's always that balancing act and uh, between representativeness and uniqueness in terms of the to the testimony. Um, but just to add that in terms of everything else that was said that that I very much agree with. You know, sometimes the over contextualization is done if it's not a survivor testimony. This is you're going to think this is a, a kind of a strange comparison, but um, think about the fact that the um, writings of perpetrators are often um, heavily contextualized by scholars because we, you know, we want to, in a way, diminish the impact and the, the resonance of that voice, right? So a kind of, there's a decision that's made, you know, an a kind of academic research decision, empirical decision. Ooh, she dropped. Oh, we lost her. Yeah. Okay. Well, just come in. Um, yeah, I was. I was just thinking about um, the name. Uh, the name just um, escaped my mind, which I shouldn't. Um, but you know, the book um, by um, another professor here at Yale about basically the the image of the genocide survivor um, is the um, Stephen is probably going to help me recover the name. Um, kind of the historical image of the survivor of genocide um, as kind of a a general um, right something represented the general victim in the post war period looking. Um, forgot the name of the book, that's gonna come back in a minute. Um, but um, just generally how, right, that experience has um, has become kind of a cultural experience rather than a unique and a personal experience. I think this is something that um, touched what um, Wendy just said. I would, I would also note that um, the idea behind the critical edition series is not exclusively this um, aimed at uh, sort of deep, contextualization. I mean, that's a part of the work, the annotation. Um, but uh, it, it's also about seeing a testimony through the eyes of the individual scholar who is working with it, right, to sort of, um, and, and that's, that's an understanding that, you know, that's your, this is your view of the value, significance um, of this testimony for historiographical questions. It's not the the only meaning this this testimony has it's 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 through the eyes of you as as the um as the scholar 
Um, uh, and I would also note that, yeah, um, I, I think this is a really, this is something that we, we haven't discussed enough. It's, it's still sort of new for us, um, but, uh, you know, at, in the end, the, the original document, the, the sort of frozen moments of anguish, et cetera, are in the audiovisual recording. Um, and they're not, um, they're not, uh, I think, uh, made less powerful by this, this textual contextualization, right? Um, it's another layer, but um, I don't think it needs to be seen as uh, a sort of a dangerous um, layer that could remove the power of the subjectivity of the testimony. Mm -hmm. That's my hope. Yeah, no, it's just something to be aware of, you know, something to kind of just, just think about um, because there is this impulse academically to add the layers, add the knowledge, you know, do the empirical work, especially on the part of an historian and to really kind of, um, you know, present that in a way and kind of show that office as advances in knowledge, right? But the layering, the layering, the layering, um, again, um, that, that potential exists there, that's all. You know, and I'll also note that um, another goal of the contextualization, of course, is that the recognition of just how complicated these documents can be, right? And so, um, you know, trying to learn about the history of the Holocaust exclusively through survivor testimony is a very difficult, if not impossible, project. So this contextualization is really ideally there to, to, to help provide um, uh, uh, the kind of understanding that might be lost if, 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 if there was not a scholar with you to help you guide you through this complex document. Um, at least that's, that's one of the, the goals. No, I agree. I agree with you, um, Stephen. I think one of the things you get that you get from reading um, the critical editions is, you know, precisely looking at how a scholar views the testimonies and what is you know, it's a whole richer world um, that she or he brings um, when they kind of view the testimony. Um, and it tries to bring it just from, you know, a story um, about the personal experience of someone into a story um, that is tied. So if you highlight a certain place, if you know the place, certain certain place was a place in which um, there was kind of anti-Jewish violence in the years that preceded that um, or preceded the war, you kind of get a whole different understanding um, of, of the relation between, you know, the, the testimony and the, and, 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 and the context of it. So I think definitely one of the things here is not, it's not so much a question of do we want, is there too much or too little mm -hmm. uh, context, it's, it's about showing how, um, how can a context center can, can offer one way to enrich our understanding of this testimony. Is, yeah. Anyone else um, have, uh, do you have any more questions um, from um, the audience, from the participants? Um, it was very um, fascinating, um, you know, four talks, very rich. Uh, I can understand that people have a lot to, um, to think about from four different um, kind of contexts and perspectives um, here. Well, I, I wanted to say one thing I think is really interesting about the possibilities of the critical editions. Um, in the, the testimonies that I'm often using in my research, I'm trying to put back together a cellular resistance organization. So by design, not everyone knew about everyone. Um, and I learn almost as much from what they don't know as what they do know. Um, and were there to be a great candidate for doing a critical edition of a, a resistance like that, you would learn so much if you were the reader going through looking at, well, here's what the witness knows and here's what had to be filled in alongside that. And I'm, I'm just, because of where I'm coming from with my work, I'm really fascinated by the, the chance to look at those two things next to each other. No, I have, to, I have to second that. Actually, I'm also thinking from the things that I work on, there's always a gap of knowledge, right? The person you're writing about knows only so much. Part of it is because during the Holocaust, I mean, knowledge was so sporadic and putting things together um, is, is, is a hard task. Um, some people's knowledge might be confined to, you know, the period in which she lives and doesn't know what's going to happen next. And we have that foresight um, or that knowledge or just because of the geographical location um, and so forth. But no, I totally agree with that. And one thing you'll see too when it comes to knowledge is um, the inconsistencies that are um, that can be there. Uh, Sidney Bruskin was asked by the Fukunov interviewer several times uh, what he 
knew about camps prior to entering into Abens A. And he completely contradicted himself in the in the process. At times, he said we had no idea about camps, and we, we just sort of stumbled into them, into this one. And I would I had never imagined anything like this. And at other times in the testimony, he says, "Well, yeah, we heard from our the other GIs that there were these camps, and and just to realize that that the testimony is messy sometimes, and that there is contradiction, and and we have to factor in that as we try to understand ourselves." So I think on um, this note, um, I'm going to, um, to end this um, event and, and I want to thank again all the speakers for their wonderful talks and presentations um, and, um, and I look forward to um, reading some of the critical editions that are going to come out. I think we all look forward to reading some of the critical editions that are going to come out from this work um, in the coming months. Um, and thank you everyone for um, coming and attending and listening to this event. Uh, Stephen, do you, would you like to add anything or? No, thanks. Thanks to everyone. This is great. And thanks to our, our, our listeners for, for sticking with us to the, to the very end.